History shows again and again how nature points out the folly of man blue oyster cult. Godzilla I am the queen of every hive. I am the fire on every hill. I am the shield over every head. I am the spear of battle. Who but I am both the tree and the lightning that strikes at the butcher pre-Christian Celtic priests often associated with nature and divination. And human sacrifice. Don't forget the human sacrifice. In modern times druidism has been revived under the new age movements minus human sacrifice. In fantasy druids are often powerful magicians or cleric very who get their powers from communing with nature. More like historical shamans. They are a mysterious bunch. No one knows who they are or what they are doing. Druids in real life The druids were the priestly class of the ancient Celts. It should be noted that we know incredibly little about the original. Ancient druids, their practices, beliefs or religion. This is because they refused to write anything down. Instead relying on memorization something that they were very good at. This was actually a rather common approach to record keeping for ancient cultures. The ancient Indians, as in actually from India, had the same mindset. Most of the information we do have on druids comes from the Romans, who the druids were enemies of, and thus must be taken with a grain of salt. The druids were not just the religious leaders of the Celts either, they also functioned as the advisors to tribal leaders were poets and entertainers, and even acted as legal experts, judges and arbiters in disputes. Training to become a druid could take somewhere close to 20 years. It should be noted that the druids were not exactly nature worshippers animists the way they are depicted in most fantasy settings. They had sacred groves of oak trees that they worshipped at, but they were pagan priests, not shamans. They worshipped a pantheon of various gods, not spirits of the natural world. Their Roman enemies had similar mindsets and even similar religious sites revering the gods and the natural world. The Druids died out in continental Europe once the Romans conquered Gaul and later would be wiped out in England as well, only surviving in Ireland and Scotland and a few parts of Wales. Once Ireland and Scotland converted to Christianity, they died out there as well. The tale of Street Patrick driving all the snakes out of Ireland is actually thought by some to be poetic hyperbole of him converting all the druids. Since there's no real evidence snakes ever lived on that island in the first place, with one exception. Bards. Basically, one of the original duties of the druids was reciting, composing and memorizing poetry, laws, stories, and history, as well as advising chieftains and kings. Bards were a subset of druids that specialized in exactly that while ignoring most of the religious or ceremonial stuff. When the regular druids died out, the bards remained, even after the coming of Christianity, albeit reduced in status to pure entertainers. Druids in D&D druids have long been a staple class of D&D where they are known for their sharper shifting abilities being able to turn into various animal forms, and being hilariously broken in 3.5e. Using this ability might incur the familiarity question, so make sure to run this by the DM prior to playing a druid. Druids although, then, always statted as neutral aligned usually ended up tracking with the good guys since, even if their official thing is all about preserve nature. The fact that bad guys in D&D tend to messing around with necromancy or summoning fiends tends to make for at least enemy of my enemy is my friend alliances. This has led several designers to restore te balance and propose druidical antagonists. We mean, beyond making them beasts or undead banshees or some shit like that. Those don't count. Read on. Druids and Beckme The druid first appeared in the companion set for Dungeons and Dragons now Beckme. Here. It was a kind of prototype prestige class, rather than a class in its own right. When a neutral aligned cleric reached 9th level, they could make a decision to either continue as a cleric or to devote themselves to the powers of nature, becoming a druid. This presented them with a bunch of new character restrictions, mandating that they live in the wilderness and forbidding them from using metal weapons or armor. In return, they could advance from their starting level of 10 to level 36 and gained access to new spells castable only by druids, in addition to casting all of the spells they had learned as common clerics. Druids in Ad and D Druids in Ad and D are grouped under the priest class, like the cleric. Though this is similar to the bard, ranger, 
and Paladin in that it has some very restrictive prerequisites to even enter the class. You need a WIS score of at least 12 and a CHAR score of at least 15. You need to be true neutral, unless you were a 2E priest of the Earth Mother of the Native American Pantheon, in which case you had to be neutral good, and you need to be a human or a half-elf, because apparently, Elves are too much of a race of tree huggers to harness the magic of nature. As is now tradition, these druids are banned from using metal armor and most traditional weapons. They also gain access to a few spheres of influence with direct relation to nature, all elemental, healing, plant, weather, with a minor dip in the divination sphere, though the player's option. Spells and magic splat remove the druid's access and divination for full access to the sun sphere. They also lost the ability to turn the undead, but gained quite a bit. The ability to talk to creatures, and resistance to charms by animals. They gained the now trademark wild shape ability at level 7, but get to heal a bit of damage in exchange to being restricted to being only real world creatures. Meaning that you can't be a dinosaur or a dire creature or anything that'd be remotely cool, you might be wondering if actual characters and universe would understand the distinction between animals a druid can change into and ones they can't. Well, good for you. The other grand thing the druid had was the big hierarchy. See, there are a fixed number of druids that can exist in the world. And after level 11 you become subject to these restrictions. The only way to level up is to either find a new region who needs a new druid to fill the vacancy or fighting a druid and taking their place in some sort of ritual combat. Apparently by level 15, you'll become the only druid of such a power level as you just replace the previous druid of this level. Beyond this are a ton of new spell slots normal shape shifting and the ability to enter and live in other elemental planes. This hierarchy also serves as the equivalent of the other classes just gaining a couple followers and their own new HQ. Whereas you have your secretive hippie order and your big imposing fortress is instead replaced with a natural grove. Unearthed Arcana recognized the market for druid players who still wanted to hang out with a post 15th level party. This allowed such to start over on the high Aerophant track. 16 20 third level. Then came the 1990s and second edition. As with the other classes, there is indeed a complete druid's handbook which, on top of explaining the hierarchy in further depth and providing kits, also has some special variant druids that were based on biomes and were separate from the kits. It also included a deeper look at the culture of the druids, considering that they are a secretive organization. Herbology and how they would fit into the bigger picture. Two years when was introduced the when good druids go bad trope. Forgotten realms has the shadow circle, which are militant anti-city druids who want to violently destroy all forms of civilization. Druids and 3E e and PF 3rd edition druids started out okay but then 3.5 and wisely introduced the feat natural spell. This let them be massively buffed bears who can summon more bears whose own stats have been buffed into the stratosphere out of their eyes while farting lightning, pissing acid, shitting explosive berries, and breathing fire that does irresistible damage. Hence, the COD, Zilla meme, truly macho, macho men. So why play a fighter, unless you have a thing for brushing bear pelts? 3 went wild boar hog wild on evil druids. Also, its blighter was an anti-druid dedicated against nature that even the misanthropes among the real druids had to oppose. A baron has two baddies, the circle of the ashbound believe, falsely, that arcane magic harms nature and that destroying magical items and users is good for nature. Long story short, it involves their founder killing a lich who'd been screwing around with nature and then noticing nature bounced back really well afterward, and the children of winter. Social Darwinists who believe that winter is coming and launch eco-terrorist attacks on civilization to winnow out the weak and ensure only the strong will be left to keep everybody from dying out during the winter phase of Iberon's life cycle. Out in the D20 Wild West's Guardlands has druids as servitors of the titans, as opposed to clerical servants of the gods, in that setting most druids are evil, 
and against nature as well, leaving only Deneb's druids to save Dark Earth. We might also mention Arcano Unearthed's various classes serving the green or the dark despite not being called druid. In Pathfinder druids were easily most nerfed class by far. Shapa shifting only adds to your ability scores instead of replacing them, so you need to actually build for melee to be good at it. Animal companions now advance completely differently, and somewhat slower. No longer being an advanced animal but completely arbitrary collection of HD and special abilities where different types of animals just get a different set of natural attacks, movement and ability scores. This also closes an exploit where more powerful animals gave a penalty to effective druid level that could be negated by taking a feat that boosts your effective druid level up to your HD to get powerful axe easily. With the release of Bestiary 2, druids gained one new power they didn't have in 3rd edition. By world shaping into a giant hippopotamus with a 4d8 bite attack, turning the normally terrible vital strike feats which double or more your weapon damage at the cost of preventing full attacks and denying you multiple attacks that would get it and other bonuses multiple times, into something that does more damage than a direct hit from modern artillery. Our very first Kickstarter is currently live and will be running until the 19th of November. The gas station after hours is a source book meant to be used as a diving board to create a game based around the setting. Players take on the role of a minimum wage employee working in a gas station. They try and go through their usual day to day activities while contending with the abnormal, supernatural, and downright dangerous. This game is meant to be completely open ended and allow for pure exploration. Your GM, general manager, will be leading down paths of oddity and horror as they see fit. One may embark on a journey completely at random using the dice roll tables or pick and choose the story threads you wish to follow. £5 for the PDF, £10 for the physical print plus postage costs. If this is something you are interested in we will only be doing this product once. You will not be able to buy the book after the Kickstarter or the PDF however we may do a second run of the book if they're not people are interested. Links down below. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbeardiacontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. D20 Modern The Shaman class introduced in D20 Past is a druid in all but name. It manages to be even crazier by keeping its many class features and gaining a bunch of bonus feats and new class features. In addition to the druid's normal abilities, it gains potion brewing. The ability to take control of magical beasts as an evil cleric controls undead and merge with its animal companion to form a single huge beat stick with crazy offense that can still cast spells. Unlike D20 Modern's other casting classes, there's actually multiple routes to take after taking all 10 levels of shaman. One could take levels of Ekelshiok for more spells and the ability to command humans instead of just magical beasts. Alternatively. One could take levels of Wild Lord to continue advancing their animal companion and gain a few more nature abilities. Druids in 4e 4th edition seriously worked to fix the Godzilla problem. Because of this, druids didn't appear until the second player's handbook. Here, they became a primal controller class, with the nebulous old faith and vague cleric but not status of earlier editions replaced with a coherent faith and a new set of pseudo-deities to worship the primal spirits. These druids don't have the animal companion of editions past, and summoning as an option was changed up, with no powers along that lines until the subsequent primal power with a distinctive array of summons and conjurations. The biggest change is to their Shapa Changing, whilst Wild Shape remains their key feature, being an at-will power that lets them turn into any animal. The original use of it is gone. Wild shape is mostly cosmetic. Instead, druid powers are split halfway between mystical effects like calling lightning bolts, teleporting and making trees eat your enemies, and special attacks for the druid's beast form with a variety of ways to maul face. This allows you to build your druid with a focus on either nature magic, being a shapa shifted killing machine, or a bend between the two. Nature's balance, one of the class features, even indicate such as necessary by letting you get 3 at will powers instead of the typical 2. 4 for the PHB human druid, 
with the caveat that you have at least one at will for both humanoid and beast forms. The druid has a pseudo subclass mechanic in the form of primal aspect, similar to those of any other class. Depending on which aspect your druid chose, you get a certain bonus when not wearing heavy armor and certain affiliated powers are more potent. Primal Guardian lets use con to determine AC. This not only consolidates some stats for you. Powers key to this aspect tend to be the closest to the default controller role with a lot of forced movement. Primal Predator added plus one speed to your wild shape. This was generally regarded as the offensive aspect which tended to key more off str and dex than con. Primal Wrath added plus one to attack with cold, fire, lightning, and thunder powers. For baffling reasons known only to the seeker, this aspect had absolutely no feat support. It's as if Watt promptly forgot about it after publishing Heroes of the Elemental Chaos. Primal Swarm aspect added a ridiculously fast scaling damage reduction when in beast form, which made it arguably the strongest tank aspect for the druid. The essentials books also gave the druid two variant classes that focused on different aspects of the druid as a class. The protector from heroes of the Feywild was a more wizard-like druid, gaining cantrips in the form of primal achievement in exchange for losing ritual caster and exchanging will shape for primal growth. An encounter power that acted as difficult terrain and had other benefits based on the druid circle selected. Renewal, the predator equivalent, gave anyone who spent a healing surge near it extra HP while shelter. The protector equivalent, made it not count as difficult terrain for allies. The other key aspect of this class was making all dailies become summon nature's ally powers. Summoning different creatures depending on both level and circle. Heroes of the Forgotten Lands gave the Sentinel. A more martial pet centric druid who followed the later essentials classes of being almost mono builds. The only major choice you get is the acolyte of the seasons feature, which determines a few bonuses as well as which pet you get. Spring, wolf, summer, bear, and wastes, living zephyr. You get an encounter power called combined attack which lets you hit and then let your pet hit as well as taking the cleric's healing word power. Druids in 13th age and 13th age Insu decided to nix the idea of a primal power source and went with the explanation that druids got divine magic through nature whereas clerics get it through gods, so yes. 13th age druids are explicitly tree worshipping hippies. While a pretty iconic class in the modern day paradigm of RPGs. They were only revealed in the 13 True Ways splat. In the gameplay department druids are easily one of the most unique classes in 13th age, and you needn't even look as far as their focus on either strength or dexterity. Dexterity, of course, can be used for attacking both up close and from afar by the way the class is set up and helps simplify which stats to focus on. But focusing on strength gives you the knock-on effect of also improving the druid's healing die from d6s to d8s. Each of their talents has two versions, an initiate and adept feature with the adept version acting as an upgraded version of the initiate talent. Since druids only get three talents, that means you are an initiate in three talents, or an initiate in one and an adept in another. The various talents you can choose from encompass the grab bag of abilities that the druids are usually associated with. Animal Companion. The same feature lifted from the Ranger. Given a few bells and whistles that were also backported to its donor class. The Adept version lets druids have a pet that fights alongside them. But only on every other battle and with one fewer recovery to spare. Going Adept not only provides a permanent companion with the full two spare recoveries but also provides access to some special daily spells centered around supporting your pet. Elemental Caster, one of two combat casting specialties. This one focuses particularly on elemental damage and the ability to summon elementals. Spending an adventurer tier feat on one specific element gives an it will spell you can always throw alongside your dailies. The reason one would want to go adept here, aside from the extra casting slots, is the ability to summon two elementals a day instead of just one. Shifter, the will shape focused specialty, with adepts being able to do so more freely. On one hand, druids have the scout form, Akka transforming into a tiny harmless creature to do a bit of reconnaissance and potentially shift the battle in your favor. On the other hand, there is the beast form, 
made specifically for combat and being able to take on daily, or near daily for adepts, abilities that make that form take on aspects of certain animals. Terrain Caster, the other offensive magic specialty, with spells determined not by choice but by the surrounding environment. As with Elemental Caster, Spending an adventurer tier feet on any of the environments gives you a special at will spell that you can always use in any environment, but the epic tier feet also lets you use an additional spell slot for a terrain spell you didn't cast that day. Warrior Druid makes druids more like magical warriors with flexible attacks like the fighter, and each is capable of being used while transformed. This specialty is a bit piecemeal as you can only pick up a certain number of features, improving AC and armor, more HP, being able to cast without triggering Aeos, etc. But whatever you didn't pick is available if you spend a feat on this talent. Wild Healer makes druids healers on par with clerics. The particular focus spell here is regeneration, which can only be cast a certain number of times per battle and per day, and adepts get more of these, and lets a target roll one recovery, get half the HP from that and then repeat it for a second turn and every turn after that so long as you keep making saves. There are two other daily spells of focus. Wild Heal, which lets the druid and some allies spend a recovery roll, and the adept exclusive greater regeneration that spends an extra recovery but gives a full heal each turn it's on. Druids in 5e and D&D 5th edition. Buff spells had been changed and the druid no longer gets an animal companion. However, this is quickly brushed aside when players realize that they can will shape into a bear at second level as a bonus action. Thanks to the circle of the moon, druid subclasses are called circles. And there are two in the player's handbook and five more in later material, plus a few in unearthed arcana. Circle of the lands druids are the ones who focus on the traditional druid as a protector of wild lands. These druids get extra spells depending on which type of land they choose arctic, coast, desert, forest, grassland, mountain, swamp and underdark. Their attunement to nature also allows them to regain spell slots on a short rest once per day, which no other druid can do, ignore difficult terrain, be immune to poison and disease, and eventually make it difficult for creatures of the natural world to attack them. This subclass is often unfavorably compared to moon druids, but in fact the two subclasses serve very different roles, though the moon druid is indeed incredibly up at its role. As most druid circles do, the land druid in particular is the well-rounded generalist caster and is a good way to ease a player into the somewhat complex mechanics of playing a druid. Circle of the moon druids are those who dream of the glory days of the Codzilla and went for the subclass that focuses on the druid's most famous feature wild shape. Moon druid abilities are all focused on improving one's wild shape. Although this time they at least have the sense to keep druids from casting spells in wild shape, at least until level 18. This subclass serves the role of Tankius Maximus the Chonk Lord. Good tank. Great tank. Best tank. Trust us. We know our tanks. And none of them are better than this tank. Just look at the amount of meat they can slap on their bones every round at max level. Huge circle of dreams druids are connected to the Feywild and are best friends with good aligned fey, since they share the same goal of protecting the magic in nature. Druids of this circle have powers related to healing, shelter, and dreams with a side of being able to travel like the Fey do. This subclass serves the role of support healer. Circle of the Shepherd Druids are Conjuration Masters Pseudo Shamans. These druids protect and heal beasts and nature spirits, and can call upon them in turn for some help and neat bonuses. This subclass serves the role of Minion Master. Circle of Spores followers are essentially Nurgle Druids, who take power from the cycle of life, death, and decay. They're creepy but generally okay folks as long as you don't have a problem with mushrooms. They were first printed in the Guild Master's Guide to Ravnica and associated with the Green Black Golgari Swarm, but they can fit in any setting. This subclass serves the role of a constant stream of damage, though at max level they become almost as brokenly hard to kill as Moon Druids. Circle of Stars Druids are astrologers who take their power from the sky instead of the land. Their world shape can instead turn them into one of three constellations. The Archer shoots magic arrows, the Chalice, 
Buffs healing and the dragon helps you maintain concentration and gives skill check bonuses. And they get a bunch of divination powers. This subclass is the Arcana Cleric of Druids. It's sort of a grab bag of abilities with no clear role in mind. Circle of Wildfire Druids do not, contrary to first appearances, just want to burn on at all the things they represent fire as part of the natural cycle. Forest fires may be dangerous, but they clear up the forest floor, kill pests, and even promote seed germination. And that is what these druids devote themselves to. As such, while these druids have standard fire spells, they are also good healers. Their main draw is that they can summon a wildfire spirit to burn foes or revive friends. Whether what contends to ever release water, air, and a themed druids remains to be seen. This subclass splits the difference between the dreams and spore druids in terms of role. Unearthed Arcano adds the undead fighting circle of twilight. And exploring a baron adds the circle of the forged, which focuses on creating and exploring the potential of the war forged. Broadly speaking, the druid subclasses in 5e take one broken part of what the druid used to be able to do. Shapper shifting spells, summoning, and give it back, thus ensuring that all the broken parts can't be assembled together in one character. 